Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to our weekly webinar. I want to thank you all for joining us this morning. Uh, my name is Patrick Halstead, and I'm introducing uh, Elmel Clemente this morning. Mel has been with us for, oh, I want to say seven and a half years or so. She's one of our uh, rising uh, designers, rising star designers, and she uh, she does a lot of uh, form aesthetic, aesthetics. So she does a lot of uh, form, uh, make it look good. Um, she's got a webinar for you this morning. We're going to talk about a bunch of things. Mel? Yeah, I'm happy to present today. This is Elmo Clemente. Hello, everyone. And if you guys are ready, I guess, Patrick, let's start recording. Yep, we're on. We're, we're ready to go. Great. All right, so today we're going to talk about querying REST from Office 365. And during this webinar, I'm, in the end, I'm going to show you some Tinker, Tinkerbell tips to how to and how to beautify your intro platforms as well. So I guess let's get started. And before we actually do, let me show you some of our websites that are up there. We've got Forms Glow. If you ever need help or some advice in your migration plans from with your existing InfoPath solutions, go ahead and visit formsglow.com. We've got a lot of resources there, some some plans for you, some advice that we can offer for your Forms future. Our main site is cadaver.com. Um, we have a lot of extensive tools and accelerators for you after, you know, over 10 years of successful um, projects with electronic forms. We are sure to be here to help you maintain your solutions and even build anything from scratch. And, of course, we've got our free forum. It's infopathdev.com. If you need free support, free help for anything about InfoPath, go ahead and visit info, infopathdev.com, and all our MVPs are there to monitor and respond to your posts. Okay, so for today, we'll be talking about querying cross-site REST connections, especially in Office 365, because nowadays people seem to be using more of Office 365, and also going to show you how to manually modify the UDC file, which is essential, especially if you're accessing one server um, to another, you know, if, if two servers from different uh, sites, from different machines are talking to each other, UDCX files are essential. And again, in the end, I'll be showing you some tips to beautify your InfoBath browser forms. So before uh, before we go on, you, before I show you some cool tricks here and what, what uh, the REST web services have to offer. Let's first talk about what is REST. So it stands for Representational State Transfer, and this is what Wikipedia technically um, defines it. But RESTful ser services are becoming a predominant web service nowadays due to its simpler style, especially its stateless mode, right? Um, clients on different platforms can access resources via this architecture with a very low complexity and also need to authenticate to the server and the OAuth is actually just the method of choice since it's an open and straightforward standard with a decent level of security. What is auth, uh, OAuth authentication? How does it carry out? Um, it does that with just a few steps. First, the server ask, we ask the server for the permission, for mi permission to request um, you know, uh, to grant access to us. So the client, for example, in our case, InfoPath, our InfoPath form, needs a pair of key and a secret word. So it's uh, usually the client ID and the client secret. Um, just credentials, which is available from the provider upon request. And this, uh, upon success, the server usually requires to log in, you know, the user to log in to the account to grant permission. And upon successful login, an access token is returned to us, and thus we can access all the available APIs and methods. And this allows us to, uh, for example, upload files, read and write data, and among others. Some examples um, of service, service providers that provide REST uh, APIs or Google APIs, there's Maps, there's a bunch of other APIs out there. I'm quite surprised myself um, in Google. There's also Dropbox and some social networking sites. Fugbugs, we use this internally. Kidabra uses this internally to track uh, bugs and, you know, to 
to store data in our bug database and even interact with our outside external customers, their Salesforce and, and a lot of others. Notes that some of them also support the um, SOAP web services. In addition, you, you can also pick which one to use. Um, but in most cases, when both alternatives are available, the REST calls are easier to create because, again, it's, it's simple, it's a lot simpler, and the results are even easier to parse and use. And it's also less resource heavy on your system. All right, so, and I'm gonna show you an example of a form that does REST, but before we do that, let me just show you this uh, screenshot of a UDCX file. Um, most of you are actually familiar with how a UDCX file looks like and how you actually modify, manually modify. Before you do, you go to your data connections library, download your UDCX file, open it in an editor, text editor such as Notepad. And here, down here, you see this um, authentication piece, this line here. This is what you comment out and specify your credentials with. Like um, for Office 365 and SharePoint 2010, if I'm not mistaken, you do specify your app ID and the credential type. But we are, what we're interested in when dealing with REST connections, we actually want to modify the web service URL itself because that's all what REST is about. You need to know, aside from the login information or the access token, you need to know the exact URL and uh, know what to pass into that URL in order to get the data that we want. So in this case, what we're modifying here, this is actually connecting to our Fug Bugs database, and uh, we're telling the URL that my command is log on. So I'm essentially trying to log on using this file, using this data connection. And so I say my email. When I initially created this data connection in my info path form, I passed actual values in my email address and my password, but didn't want to store that in the UDCX file, right? So what I did, I went ahead to the data connections library and manually modified to just uh, change the actual email address and the password to some dummy text there. That way I know that no one can access my credentials. And for my demo, let me show you uh, some nifty form that I created for you. Let me open up my Internet Explorer. I've got my Office 365 site here. Not sure why my mouse keeps jumping, but let's bear with it. So I click New here, and it's opening my sample form. So I'm calling this weather sample. It's all just, at first, it's uh, asking for a valid address. So I've already typed in a couple before. So let me just select one of those and tab out. And as soon as I tab out, you'll see the, the some s static image of the map here and also um, the street view image. And what this, uh, what just happened, as soon as I tabbed out of that address field, is it queries the Google Maps API, API and returned the coordinates from the return the latitude and the longitude. And these are what we're going to use to then query the get weather, the weather web services, the rest web services, to then return the data that's going to show up at the oh, bottom Mel, of the Mel, why did you pick that address? What on earth? That's, that's an incredible picture there. <laughs> incredible corporate know, business front there. <laughs> I know. <laughs> and yeah, that's Cadaver's address. That's where we are. <laughs> so we, we are virtual. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you saw that as soon as I click Get Weather there, it shows me this handy information at the bottom, shows me the current conditions and the forecast for today if it's going to rain or whatnot, what chances are there to rain. Apparently, Seattle is a rainy <laughs> city. Um, but yeah, um, let me try one more address here. I'm just going to say, say City Hall, New York. Tab out again. It's going to change the images. And it's showing us the New York side of <laughs> the world. and. Uh, a static image for the street view there. You get the weather. You've got an updated data at the bottom there. So again, this is all happening. Be your rest. Patrick, are you going to say something? 
I was going to say, uh, for those of you watching, um, you may be wondering what, what she's demoing, but this is actually InfoPath in 365. Yeah, it new <laughs> <laughs> can, can you show them the form of the designer, Mel? I guess that's what you're going to do next. Yeah, Sorry, yeah, Bobby. Sure, sure. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I, just, I guess we're moving there next because um, that's one of my tips. If you can look at the background here. Um, let's see. So this is the info path form of the designer. So all there is is just the background there and some text with some images that are coming from secondary uh, data source, these guys here are coming, actually the data comes from a secondary data source and we're just setting the main fields to the value we're getting. So um, I guess that's that, I'll show you the tips since we're in our well, whole, platform. Mel, this is really awesome and I, I just want to ask you how you did it because I'm completely flummoxed even uh, as an InfoPath MVP. Can you show them the data connections and walk through it a little bit? <laughs> Yeah, I'm getting excited here. Let me show you the data connections. So first, the geocoding, like I said, it's connecting to, of course, we're not seeing it right here because it's already a UDCX file, but um, I can try going there, but it's probably going to take my travel a little bit of time, but again, that is coming from, that is using Google APIs, Maps, Google Maps API. And I think I can get there really soon now. So we've got the geocoding UDCX files here. And this shows you how you can go to your data connections library, get your UDCX file located in the text editor. And if you need to edit it, you can do so in the text editor. Now you mentioned earlier, uh, you mentioned earlier, Mel, that um, that you don't have to hard code the credentials. Do, is that true or, or do you still have to do that? That is true for our case here. And this uh, exact example, the webinar sample, doesn't require authentication. It um, can be accessed publicly. But the one for support form, which is the one which we use internally, which of course needs more you know, level of security, it doesn't store the, the credentials um, anywhere, except we are only storing the token. You know, we've logged in once. We told our, our other info path, remember that resource list form. We told mm -hmm. it our username and our password. It didn't store it anywhere because those are part of the secondary data source. But then after we've obtained the token, that's what we've been using everywhere. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, are you gonna? Are, can we include that support form in the uh, package that we send to people after the webinar? Sure thing. If they fill out the survey, okay. How do, that's great. Thank you. How do you change the uh, the the address there, the query string uh, in the uh, UDC on the on the fly? You. Oh yeah. So all right. So when you initially create the data connection, you need to be you need to build the schema, right? You need to have something that shows, uh, you know, your schema to look like this. And so in order for that to happen, you need to pass in valid address right at the beginning of your data connection creation. And so you're going to want to dynamically change the value, right? Um, whatever you pass in as the address here. So what's happening is that cursor keeps jumping. If I look at the rules in that address field, I am changing the rest URL to let's open this rule. Basically just concatenating everything from the maps.google.apis.com and then up to the address where we pass that and we just change the value to whatever I add I enter in the address field. Oh, that's cool. And that, for, for those of you, yeah, that, that's awesome. Well, for those of you who don't know, this change REST URL was a new feature that Microsoft added in 2010. Yeah, and you get that option in your actions if you actually have a REST data connection in your form. So this is that guy right there. And so after that, we call the data connection and set the latitude and longitude with the returned data. 
from that REST web service. And so looking at the next step, which is get whether um, we are doing the same thing. We're changing the weather data connection. It's REST. And this is where it's, uh, the service provider is forecast.weather.gov. And we pass in the latitude value in the LAT parameter, they call it, and then the longitude um, and everything else that's just fixed there. And we call the weather data connection. And as far as the pictures that you're seeing here, these static images here, we are not using any web service for these guys to show up. They're actually just pictures that are returned as hyperlinks, and I've got default values in them um, that are also dynamic based on the value in the coordinates. Not sure why this is not clicking. But yeah, it's same URL, but um, just different coordinates based on what we return from that address. So it changes dynamically as well. So right. uh, this is Patrick Halston again. And once again, I'm an InfoPath MVP helping me out with the presentation. And sorry for if, if I'm distracting some folks with my, my, my male voice here. <laughs> but <laughs> and thanks, thanks, Jonathan, for the comment. Um, I'll try to tone it down a bit. Um, but um, I'm here to also kind of provide that kind of question front for Mel so that we can have an interactive demo. And, um, and Mel's going to show some really cool tips next. Uh, she's going to show you how to create this, this wonderful dashboard image on the form, which some of you um, may have thought was not possible in 365 with browser-based forms. And really, it, it's, a, it's one of the Tinkerbell tips today, and it's, it's really cool. And Mel's the one who figured it out. Mel? Be happy to share it. So tip number one, um, background images make them crawl. So what do we mean by that? If you guys have been practicing using background images, um, most of you may have experienced getting this as the result, right? So oh, Mel, can you, can you go into presenter mode again? Sorry. Yes. Yeah, here we Thanks. go. So yeah, at first I got this. This is my background image, and I, I popped it in the browser after I published, and I get a white like background at the bottom here, which is not really nice. So what we do want is to make the entire image crawl all the way through, um, vertically, whether it's vertically or horizontally. And how do we do that? Let me show you. So if we go to page design and properties, we say that our background picture is that uh, picture of the cloud there with a little bit of dark blue background. If we don't say, let me just add this to my palette so I can reuse it. If we don't say use a background color, what do we get? We get nothing because this, this form is that the image is actually big enough to occupy my entire screen. But um, yeah, we get that white space at the bottom. And what you're going to want to do, let me just, let me just show you uh, so it's clearer. If I click new form here, let's see what we get. And if I expand my, yeah, there we go. So yeah, after I fix, what, what we want to do first in order to make the image crawl is take the last uh, take the color at the very bottom there. Um, you can use some tools. I u personally use Pixie. If I'm, yeah, I'm talking about Tinkerbell, it's like Pixie dust, okay? Um, the tool called Pixie to get that, uh, the RGB, the red, green, blue uh, combination of that color, and then specify that as the, specify that as the background color right here. And so I know that, um, it's going to get that radiant effect, right? And aside from that, even though I've already done that, you saw that before I, I went to the property screen, it's already checked, right? It's already enabled. But well, how come I still have that white thing going on? Um, what you want to do is add a table, your, your last table in your form. You're going to make it set the row instead of automatic. Best practice is to do automatic for all tables. That way, all of the row heights are standard or are the same. But for your last, in this case, for your last row, set it to the most, you know, 
um, the most number of pixels depending on your user's screen size. In this case, I'm setting 800. Because I have a big screen, I needed to uh, to make that my my Internet Explorer window a bit, uh, you know, bigger for that effect to to show. But yeah, basically that's that's it. <laughs> Um, wow, Mel. But as no. soon as you'll notice, as soon as I, mm -hmm. I didn't even know you could do that, and I'm an Impopath MVP. <laughs> yeah, that's just some tricks that you discover along the way when you're like seven and a half years just doing Impopath or something. <laughs> and if you love designing forums, so yeah, again, how to do that? Set your background image to whatever you want. Set the background color to the last pixel, the very. Um, very last color at the bottom for that gradient effect and then set the row height of your last row to the maximum you can think of. Um, that's my first tip. <laughs> for my second tip, oops, I'm sorry, let's do this from my current slide. All right, so label your buttons dynamically. What do we mean by that? We don't want this kind of design see the buttons at the bottom here we've got like one two like six buttons at the bottom each for I guess its own action right we don't want that as the designers it's hard to maintain whenever I want to change something and if, for example they have a rule that's identical if I change it from one button I need to change it in every other button right and that's kind of hard to maintain for me what we want to do is we want just one button with a dynamic label. And how do we make it dynamic? Let me show you in my form in the designer. So this is our support form. This is yet another REST, um, uh, using REST web services, connecting to our Fugbugs database. Here's our dynamic button. Oops, did I just delete that? So button properties, it's, uh, it's just storing the action there and the action is triggered um, it's changed whenever I click any of these picture buttons there we love picture buttons right um, wouldn't it be cool if if we can set them dynamically as well but no um, so each of these uh, picture button at the top sets the action to whatever I want them to be and so that's what's going to show up in my button down there and then my action node is where all my rules are right oh, that's so cool. I said, yeah I and Mel that. Mel can you go back to the button real quick and just show them again the label before you go to the action because I think you went over that pretty quickly so she's setting the um the label property here is actually uh, pointing to a field in the in the form, and that's what's getting changed. Um, and I just want to make one more comment, Mel. I just want to make a comment for those of you who just joined us. Mel did a, a great demo uh, in a webinar. I want to say it was about six months ago, Mel, where you showed the um, con all the rules in one place. Um, so for those of you who have forms that have rules, um, the best practice is to centralize those rules into one place and that's what Mel has done here with the action one field so that, sorry Mel yeah yeah so what we're doing is we're setting we're setting the action field to the value that we want for example and click of the assign button we set the action to assign and on change we'll see that that, that action node does some cool stuff here, just sets the date and time and everything else to toggle the visibility and all that. But looking at your dynamic, uh, your button here that's labeled dynamically, on click of that, we want to trigger the submit value to one. That's if we're not actually emailing and we're doing something else if we're emailing. And so um, I didn't have to have a lot of buttons with different set of rules that when I want to update one, I need to update everything else, right? I just need to update the rules in my submit and my send email notes at once. So this is where all the submit stuff is happening, right? So I guess that's that. And what I want to show you is how it's actually happening in the browser. So this is how the Kadabra software 
I'm sorry, the customer support form looks like. And this is another example of how, of how you make your background images uh, crawl. Because uh, at the top here, um, this is actually just this image, which is that, I guess it's a three pixel um, image that I told my info platform to to tile uh, horizontal, horizontally. And then at the bottom here, this is just all background color, solid background color of uh, gray. And so uh, I guess I should have, let me try and search an existing case here. So my picture buttons at the top appear. And I hope I'm not taking so long. I just want to show some cool tricks here that's all <laughs> uh, yeah so we're seeing the buttons at the top here and once I click edit for example it's gonna the forms gonna sync and does its job and so what I get down here it's my buttons gonna get labeled edit because I clicked edit at the top there um, if I try to try to do that again this time I'm gonna click reactivate for example so I say reactivate, and my dynamic, uh, my button will be labeled reactivate dynamically, and it's it's gonna it's gonna think what to do next based on my rules in that submit and send email notes. Okay, I guess if you have questions on that later, we can definitely get to them. But for right now, let's move on to our. I'm sorry, I want to do this. Let's move on to our tip number three. Here we go. So debug your forms on the fly. What do we mean by that? So just make yourselves, uh, your lives easier as the developer of the form. So there goes one user complaining, I wasn't able to submit my form, I don't know what to do. So you don't know what to do either because uh, the user already uh, executed the actions and you don't have a clue as to how to repro stuff, right? But what you uh, what you want to do there is this is for for example this is how uh, it looks like my form looks like if I'm not debugging so it's just all the footer the footer and the logo but there's a trick there this logo is actually a button that will turn my debug mode on just like this so it's going to show a tiny little section at the bottom with all the debug details with with the essential information that I might need to look at if uh, you know, issues occurred, occurred in my form. And so this is the guy right here. So I'm just setting if debug is not equal to true, then hide it. And this button is actually what toggles it on and off. And you might not want to do that in your logo, you know, um, users. There's an impression if there's a logo, if you click on it, you go to the website, right? You might, you might just want to add an, a hidden button somewhere you know where, where it is, right? In order to get that debug uh, section showing. That's a great those tip. Those are huh? all my tricks for today. I, <laughs> yeah, I've got a lot more, but time, <laughs> you know. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's, that's wonderful. So just a quick recap for those of you who joined us uh, late. My name is uh, Patrick, and I'm the InfoPath MVP with Mel today. Uh, of course, she's got some tricks that I didn't even know about. But um, we're, we're here to answer your questions. Uh, what Mel did today was she went over how to connect to a REST web service, and she showed you the UDC file at the very beginning of the webinar um, and, and talked about how to, how to change the query string. And then she showed you how to change the REST URL on the fly, and we used the Google Maps uh, API to get the address. Um, get the longitude and latitude for an address and then pass that to a weather service which returned images via REST so that she could show the current weather for that location. And we're going to send all of those into a package to you if you fill out the survey. I want to thank you all for joining us. At this time, uh, if you have any questions whatsoever, um, we're here to answer them. And Mel's just going to show that first demo again here for those of you who, who joined us late. Um, so any questions? You can see here that, uh, Mel, why don't you put in your Manila, Manila address? I'm kind of curious what the weather's like where you're at. Do you have oh, a... What, you know what's, yeah, you know what's, uh, what my form doesn't have is validation if the address is correct. So let me try if my form's going to be smart enough to know. Basic City... Uh, 
While Mel is uh, t typing in the address into Google, I'm just going to respond to a couple that work. Looks like it hasn't refreshed on, on the screen. Oh, yeah, it doesn't like the Philippines for some reason. <laughs> just type in, um, type in San Francisco or something just to show them it's different. Yeah. Uh, so Steve's got a question. Um, so while Mel is doing that in the background, I'm going to answer Steve's question. Steve's question is, any update on InfoPath Futures? Um, hey, Steve, uh, thanks for coming today. Um, yeah, you know, we talked about this last week. Um, Microsoft um, is uh, had this plan uh, in March of last year to uh, launch forms on SharePoint lists, which uh, they called FOSL, F-O-S-L, and they announced it at the SharePoint conference. That effort has been um, shelved, um, as far as what I've heard. And, and therefore, they're starting again from scratch, and uh, they're they're going to be pushing InfoPath out uh, probably another year in terms of the sunset. Uh, so they're going to be shipping it again in 2015. That's the word on the street. Um, don't say you heard from me, but um, but that's the the word on the street. So InfoPath is still uh, no migration plan from Microsoft, um, and the uh, sunset date is now 2024, 2025 uh, is my guess, because they're shipping it again. They have a 10 year. A support contract with their customers. So, so yeah, that's good news because it gives us more time um, to plan for our future. Once again, your forms data is all open, so InfoPath is great. Unlike other applications, that data is just all XML, so it's very easy to reuse um, in other applications down the road. But yeah, right now, InfoPath is uh, still alive and kicking. As you can see here, Live 365 site, all this stuff works. We've got thousands of customers, millions of XSNs uh, out in the wild in the United States, and that means that um, it's not going away anytime soon. Question from Megan. Um, oh, thank you, Megan. She's saying we did a good job. Thank you very much, um, and I appreciate your patience this morning. Um, we're trying to use GoToMeeting across the globe here. It's a worldwide effort. Um, and then uh, Lionel, question on the webcast. Uh, we did record it, yes, indeed. And we're going to make that recording available on our YouTube channel. So don't forget to go up to you know, youtube.com slash Qdabra, and we'll have that up there. And if you fill out the survey at the end of this, in a minute or two, we'll send you the package of all the goodies. And we're here to help you uh, implement the form or parts of the form in your form if you need any help whatsoever. We've got the free InfoPath Dev Forum. You can also purchase a support pack if you want, like just-in-time service from us to get your thing unblocked. But we could probably help you put this in your form in less than an hour. Um, it's pretty simple stuff. Um, but, but yeah, you can do it yourself. Look at the webinar, um, look at the sample, and um, look forward to hearing from you. Any other questions? Well, I want to thank Mel for this wonderful demo. This has been one of the most amazing demos lately, Mel. Really, um, you surprised me in lots of ways. A really beautiful, beautiful demo example. And um, thanks, everyone, for being here. Have a great day. Yeah, I think so.